it gave me a chance to finish my whiskey anyway, so. You only uh, so what took like two sips of the. Yeah, I know. I was. Well, it was so. He pulled me right in. <laughs> Usually, sometimes I rely on this a little bit just to help cut the nervousness. <laughs> well, if you wanted to use it like that, you should have done it like three I, I glasses. I actually you know? didn't didn't do that this time because I knew as soon as as soon as we got going, I knew as soon as we started talking, it was gonna get. It was gonna take a lot of energy to focus and make sure I understood what was going on. Cause he, he like, as soon as I, I like, I kind of asked my initial question and immediately it was like, I don't know how long his first kind of soliloquy was. Soliloquy was it was like, but it was like he, he gave me so much content. I was like, I don't even. You need but, the nervous sharpness. Yeah. Well, I was like, okay, I, I can't afford to dull to dull any of my mental capacities here because I know this is going to be technical and I know I'm going to need to pay attention. I have, I felt like I had a little bit of that when I was talking to J, uh, JF Martel, mm -hmm. where I was like having, I, I was feeling a little bit nervous for that one too. And then mm -hmm. I, I was like, okay, I, I poured a little bit too too large of a glass and hadn't hadn't eaten in a while. Yeah. And I was like getting midway through the conversation, I was like. Uh, I, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> you can't zone out for a second yeah. when no, you're the you one who's responsible, whereas I can no. just be I off in the my clouds. From there. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, there was a lot, there was a lot there. A lot of what, I mean, John just said a lot and I, I still have a lot of, I don't know. There's a, there's a lot that I still need to, I, I, I'm, I'm like, same thing I said with JF. I'm like looking forward to go, going back and listening to that again. Cause then I can, <laughs> try to process and follow what was going on a little bit more. I'm not sure if that's just a, like it's just sometimes harder to, in the moment, maybe there's just the pressure of like recording. So it's like you're trying to think about what you're going to say next a little bit. But I mean, I'm not, I'm well, it's like the talking. one context in which you have the ability and luxury of going back on it though. Yeah. Like in a regular conversation, you're like, whoa, I'm never going to know what yeah. I forgot. <laughs> Or whoa, yeah. but at, at least I mean, in a regular conversation, and may, maybe we'll get to talk to John again. But in a regular conversation with a regular person, part of your life, you can always just talk to them again and ask them about it again later. But in this case, you have a little bit of that, so you can just go, or you you have that through being able to listen to it again. Yeah. But you you were you had a question, or you were trying to think of a response to what he said about like just denying technology lifestyle. I mean, I'm still trying to understand. Well, he specifically was talking about like very short form and then he was talking about his lectures and things mm. and like other things in contrast to that. Yeah. And like how it affects your social circles and the people you interact with. And I think partially it's a bit of a difference when it comes to your family or those who are a bit older but like to be connected with someone within my age group it, it almost seems right. like you'd like need to yeah, you, have like a basic this understanding is the thing, of, that it really does feel like you're an outsider it, and the, the younger you are i think the more this becomes the case like like you're experiencing this but i don't feel like an outsider i'm saying if i didn't partake in all the stupidity of instagram and really short form right. content then i would be <laughs> right well that's what i'm saying it's like it, 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 but as i was thinking about that like there is more to, like to friendship and connection than just being yeah. able to connect on like what's culturally relevant. But the more or, or the less cultural um, connections you can make or the less uh, uh, just connections doesn't have to be cultural, but like culture is a great way of making a whole bunch of connections at once. If you both participate in the same culture, mm -hmm. the, the more general the culture, the less meaningful the connection is, I think. But the more so it's just like if you if you're going to be go, going to be part of a skateboarding group and you don't pay attention to the prominent figures in that group, then it, like then you don't get to participate in the community with as little friction as, as everybody else. Like, the, the people who know what's going on in a conversation, people don't feel, like, frustrated because they're going to have to explain a whole bunch of stuff to them whenever they start talking about something they're interested in. If, if you just don't get any of it, and you're constantly just, like, interrupting the flow of the conversation because you don't get it, <laughs> yeah. that, that actually does ruin your engagement and your ability to engage in, and people's desire for you to engage with them. Yeah, but, but like that that's the other part of it is that you do live in the segmented aspects of like what you like and like what's relevant to you. Mm -hmm. So if you can recognize the areas that are damaging and still connect with people, like I would say skateboarding or any sports probably not nearly as negative to have that knowledge of it. <laughs> like it's potentially positive. But there's still like 
I'm not, I don't. I don't think this is necessarily. I don't, I don't think this is the, where his argument is going. But this is this is an argument, and I'm not sure how to differentiate it from his position. But if you're just to, I mean, the the, the Netflix documentary about like the social, it's called the social, social network, dilemma. Social dilemma. Social dilemma. Um, it basically just presents the problem and says, yeah, th- this sucks. You should just fast it and stop doing it. And I, I don't like. I mean. Again, you're saying skateboarding is better. It's a better community. I agree. But even to participate in that community <laughs> at your age, you have to participate in so much internet community as well. And if we just kind of just write off internet as a bad technology, as something that we can't do. But I'm, you know, given what he said, I mean, th- there is so much to try to process. I, I think part of what he was saying, though, is that that process of relevance realization or the, or the what did, what did he call the um, op- opponent processing? Mm-hmm. Did that make sense to you too? I was struggling with that one a bit more, probably. Okay, let me. I, I, I think he, he was pretty quick about it, but I think it actually is not too hard to grasp. It's just the difference between. I mean, he he gave the example of a zero sum game or a non zero sum game. A zero sum game is where there's a winner, mm-hmm. you, like a sport, a sports match. At least within just the confines of that game, a sports match. <laughs> like let's say a football game. No, you can stick with your sports just match. Sp- <laughs> as soon as you go <laughs> you're football, you're not going <laughs> to. Okay, I should probably <laughs> keep it more general. So when you're playing sports ball, yeah, yeah. and it's you're just li- like it's not iterative. You're just thinking about that game. There's a clear winner. And one side wins, and the other side loses. Mm-hmm. Right. The but as soon as you kind of get a larger perspective, so that would be a, a zero sum game. It's yeah, yeah. Only one side wins. One side actually loses and is worse off afterwards. Within the confines of the game, but if you actually if if you think about it as a sport, the the rules are developed in such a way, so that way both teams aren't really at a loss after, or or it's not one team has has won and one team has lost, but they're not there's not a net loss. Wait, we were talking about these two different kinds of improvements, Pareto improvements versus Caldor Hicks improvements. You remember this? Yeah, I mean, I, a Caldor I, Hicks improvement is where there's a trade off that happens, but there's a net gain in the system. So. Where one side gets something more, gets more out of the situation. So, like, one team actually wins. They get more fame. But this this is a Caldor Hicks improvement. Yeah, yeah. But both teams get the, like, because of the rules of the game, because there's referees and stuff like that, they don't actually destroy their ability to continue to play the game. And so... What is zero-sum game only happen once? Yeah, zero-sum game, it's like, <laughs> it's not iterative. A zero-sum game is like you play the game and everybody's dead after that, <laughs> right? Or everybody on the losing team is dead, yeah, right? Okay. They can't actually, they can't act afterwards. But a non-zero-sum game, which is the way sports are, are designed to work, is so that way you both learn from the experience. You both have fun and you both even, I mean, you, people who have a career playing sports, they actually, they, they make money out of it too. But even just on the, on the level of like playing the game and engaging the game more deeply and like learning how to play it better, the way that the, the rules are there so that way it's a non-zero sum game is that both people benefit from playing together. And most both times you're playing with anybody, they're ev- whenever you're playing a game with somebody and it's not destroying you emotionally or destroying your, you physically, usually you're playing that game because you've, I think, probably passively determined that it's it's a Caldor Hicks improvement is that you know somebody's going to win on one level and so they're going to ha- get a little bit more they're going to get some more positive uh feeling out of the experience but they're also going to have we're, we're both going to get to have this payoff of having played the game and, and having had the experience of playing the game and maybe getting better at the game so opponent processing is that it's when you have two things that are opposed their opponents but they process things by having this give and take where they both move forward, even though there's a clear winner in some situations. Yeah. Does it I think that's good. Makes a bit more sense. So, okay, where was I going with that? Why did I bring up opponent processing? Oh, no, okay, I think I think I get it. So he, he was talking about how to figure out what's relevant to you. And we're trying to figure out how to figure out what's relevant to us when it comes to Instagram. and. Well, you'd first supporting. say that it's probably not a zero-sum game. Like engaging with, or is is that example? Are you trying to overlay it? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I, well, I, I think that's where my mind was going. Is that like, there's a clear, there's a back and forth that needs to happen there. You don't just give up and give in to one of the sides. That would be playing a a, a zero sum game, and just a zero sum game ultimately destroys either side's ability. I mean, if if you're playing sports and one side kills the other team, 
And they do that over and over again until there's no teams left. They can't continue to get better at the sport. They've actually destroyed their game. Mm -hmm. Right? So opponent processing is is figuring out how to have a relationship with it that that I mean it's like the rules of the game so it like it, it prevents you from being too violent too um too overpowering I, okay I, I want to come back to that thought I'm, I'm think anyways with with social media maybe that process of feed that a feedback loop or that like back and forth opponent processing thing can play out of maybe you versus social media like just t- taking the relationship further like I don't know. I, the, the problem I'm struggling with there is that it seems like social media isn't playing fair. And most of the our cultural engagement devices like media, uh, sugar, I, I was saying it, like the, the, the three main manipulators are, are like stories that want to hijack our attention. So that's like stories that just, well, st- stories are an interesting one, but the, the two easiest ones are, are food and sex. Like there's everything everything is out there kind of hijacking our ability to our like i mean there, there's sugar there's so many foods there's like msg everywhere there's so many things that are like not playing fair in this in this sports game sports ball that we're playing and i feel like they're destroying destroying my ability to engage with them like See, this is where I'm getting lost again because this this problem is just sprawling out for me. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like, I feel like you could acknowledge that they are not playing fair and that social media doesn't have your best in mind. And I don't think that's a bad thing to say, but still having to come to terms with somehow using it in a small degree or however yeah. it ends up playing out. It, it, the responsibility ends up being totally on your shoulders because you you're not even in a situation where well, I, I guess you have a small amount of feedback that you're able to kind of like the conversation between you and social media. Social media is this abstract entity that you can't like talk to and say, hey, you're not playing fair. Although you sort of do that to the extent that you you limit it. And I mean, this is what he was talking about. You can make social change just by making personal change, which mm-hmm. becomes a kind of extended community change and things like I that. I think there's like a general dissatisfaction at the moment and people are like trying to figure out like, what what do I do to make the situation better for me? And if you have people who are like, hey, my situation is better due to this, then that definitely would point them in the right direction. Wait, say that again. So like you're like, oh, I, I'm just I'm depressed and I feel like I can't have my attention span long enough to think about anything. And then it might be as a result of things that you're doing, or like too much social media or whatever. And then yeah, someone who's not. It seems like... Th- with he described this this feedback loop of of with alcohol where like the more you have of it the more your options diminish and the more the only thing that makes sense is to just drink more alcohol. yeah but it he doesn't like say that's the game that that msg food no but he or, doesn't say you sh- i don't maybe i don't MSG know if he's gonna say like you, sh- you gotta be sober like it doesn't mean that you just reject the alcohol entirely it right. means you you drink it in a but, you, we do do that with, with some drugs. With alcohol, the, the the slope is it's a it's a slippery one, but the 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 tip of the slope isn't quite as bad. We can we can grapple with it. Most people don't have to swear off of alcohol, though. Some people do. Some people just personally can't handle it. But when it comes to like meth, we just say that is way too steep of a slope. That, like, as far as I understand, with meth, you have one experience of it, and it's the most dopamine you've ever experienced it's it's like basically possible i think for your your, your <laughs> yeah. body to experience and then after that you will never get that high again but after you've experienced that there's nothing literally nothing else makes sense other than to just keep getting high because that's the only that's the o- only way to be happy so right? we just basically classify everything in our lives against meth and you're like if it's below that <laughs> then we can do it. Well, yeah, is, is is meth the bench line <laughs> or the benchmark? We just have like one person out of every ten do it and like tell us how everything <laughs> maps up against it. But I'm I'm. It feels like social media. It feels like video games. It feels like. It feels like even the way sex is marketed and and erotic, like um, marketing. Guess, yeah, erotic marketing or like movies. Like so many of these things are just trying to pull you into that same kind of hole the same way that meth or, or, or too much alcohol can. And I don't, it seems like the line for social media is a, is a fuzzier one. Like, like alcohol, a lot of people can handle. Meth, 
basically nobody can or almost nobody can maybe there's some people that somehow i don't know i i jared was telling me about there's some guy that's like that's addicted to um heroin that that is like fully functional and it, i think he's I like a professor the studying thing. this oh right? maybe yeah so that, i mean that's that's strange yeah but, and i would imagine that that's a pretty limited number of people that can that can live life that way but it seems like it might be the case that a lot of even if it's just 50 percent of people can't have a healthy engagement with social media or with a lot of the media that we're we commonly in, interact with and how i think it's maybe also Perhaps like check the camera just go partially the same thing with alcohol that you do as a test with social media is to why you're engaging with it like he mentioned from a place of depression drinking causes the spiral versus using social media from a place of needing something from it like then it can end up taking you in a place you don't want to be versus there's certainly people who can have a like a casual relationship with social media but it's usually not many people so I, I mean, almost everybody i know who like who has become frustrated about this problem and has been trying to solve it usually re res they usually revert to a or resort to a fast of some kind and then after that and then they, like i mean uh i don't know I don't even want to bring up his name because I don't. I don't really. Res I don't. I don't like listening to him anymore. But Dave Rubin. I, okay, go on. <laughs> he's he's probably a great guy. No, I mean, I I just personally don't, don't to, find him that interesting anymore. You don't have he, to he, hate. He's, he's the genuinely things, trying to pursue yeah. truth. You know, he's he's probably a good person. I I don't hate him, but I just don't find him that interesting anymore. Um, but his he had a the the point in his you know his content career that i found most interesting was when he started to grapple with this problem and he started talking about social media and i think as far as i know he just yearly goes on a off the grid kind of fast and i mean maybe that sort of sort of a ritual of like just like maybe i don't use social media on this day of the week maybe we constantly need to do that in order to reorient ourselves a little bit i'm not i'm not it's sure they're jewish Pardon? Not in a bad way. Pardon? So that's rather Jewish, but not in a bad way. I think. Like, not in a bad way. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that makes me sound like. Okay. What are you getting all anti-Semitic here? <laughs> that sounds Jewish. Not. I mean, I know you're assuming I meant in a bad way, but not in a bad way. I like Jews. I love Jews. <laughs> no, but like, I think there is some history of like refraining from like things that they enjoy on like a, i think even like saturday of every week sure so i think even another figure ben shapiro i think from what i understand he does the whole thing like every saturday he doesn't engage with his phone or whatever so so i mean that is that's just doable. tithing right or, yeah sure it's tithing and, and that's it's ritualistic so it's doable so it's not like you have to think about it you just do it it's just yeah. part of your week that, i mean i mean maybe that is a, a very practical thing that that we can't i mean i even you suggested, like, or you you mentioned that you had heard somebody like doesn't use their phone before bed, doesn't use it first thing in the morning. That stuck with me, and I've I've been trying to do that. I've been pretty consistent about it for the past year, and that's I feel like that's helped. I mean, I I just still I, I guess it's just that this week I'm feeling emotionally exhausted, and so this week I just feel a little bit more defeated by this this monster of social media and and these monsters of of attention seekers. Yeah. I don't mean people specifically, but I just mean the, the abstract forces of attention seeking that are, you know, that are trying to sort of hijack all of my relevant circuits. Yeah, I think talking about how social media can do that to you or like basically putting it in its place. And then when you're in a place of weakness, you can end up sp starting that negative spiral of like... <laughs> you kind of lose yeah. those walls that you put put up to protect yourself basically. Mm -hmm. And I kind of see that like even in myself and my, my lack of uh, discipline, like as soon as I lose a little bit, it's so much easier to lose that much more. Mm -hmm. And like now, now I'll be at the stop point that spiral. Like once it's starting to occur, <laughs> I mean, there's two ways I'd imagine it's like the full fledged cold Turkey. Yeah. If you want to, yeah, you have to literally just that. use your willpower. Yeah. Or you just like say, I'm going to stop and you don't or like, <laughs> you, you do like there's two ways bit. either do it or don't <laughs> <laughs> or like, Oh, I'm just going to weed myself off. But like that usually doesn't work though. Or like saying, I'm just going to use a little bit less, mm -hmm. but like, yeah. well, okay. G given the context of the conversation we just had with John, I think 
There's another. So it's just. I don't if you think of yourself yeah. as an individual, then you can use your individual will- willpower. But if you think of yourself as a participant in an abstract being that is your community, then you can offload. I mean, your will. Like I, I watched a video last year or earlier this year about a guy trying to figure out. I mean, he was deeply struggling with an addiction to Super Smash Bros. And I was like, I, I relate, man. <laughs> and he. He was like trying to get school done and it was like he was wasting all of his willpower not playing Super Smash Bros. <laughs> and he couldn't spend it on and he, he started reading some studies and realized they're actually that's how your brain works. You you literally have a limited commodity that is your willpower and you can spend it different ways. And okay. once it's overspent, you just stop being able to to to, <laughs> to you don't have you just lose most of your control over yeah. it. like you just kind of your get brain's taken over like by not your, cooperating. Yeah. Yeah, you become taken over by that like animalistic urge part of yourself where it's just you could just be easily hijacked by anything it's like if you want to do it then you do it because your your willpower is just run out you spent it and so he realized that he was able to overcome that by taking super taking the game super smash bros and putting it in he got this thing from amazon it's like a glass box with it with a lid that you can set a timer on that locks the box and you're actually not there's no way to open it until um well, unless you want to break it, I know. I was that was in the social in, in the social uh, dilemma again. That that thing was in the. Did you watch the social dilemma? No. Okay, but that I think one of the characters in the, the drama part of that they actually get one of those. But anyway, yeah. he realized that because he wasn't planning on breaking the box, maybe he got a plastic one. That's probably harder to break than a glass one. Um, but he he got this box that literally it just made it. It's not possible to play Super Smash Bros. Or at least that was the way he he thought of it. He was processing the situation. Mm-hmm. It's not possible to, to do that. So he set it off limits for himself and then he suddenly, it was like, it was just no sweat. It's just, now I can just work. I, I don't have to try not to play this. I don't have to try not to do this. So there yeah. are ways of offloading your... Well, it's like the amount of effort you have to exert to do the thing and if you make it just hard enough that you can't force yourself to do it, like just knowing how much is it's going to take out of you to get to the thing you want, Maybe it's not that much, but just having some barrier is is definitely, and like I see that with within phone usage is like turning on airplane mode, but mm-hmm. I mean you can always just turn it off. But. I know, and that's the problem is like I was like okay, I'm gonna keep airplane mode on for like the morning, mm-hmm. and then it's like it's so easy to just kind of it's, justify it, like well what if somebody needs to text me it's like, easier though to not do that if you've already set especially if you, if you ritualized it, it a little bit right? yeah but then it's tricky i, I think i think you can offload it to your, a little bit of the pressure to your community too like by making a community commitment like by saying this is what i'm doing you talk to your family <laughs> then people keep you accountable and that's that's the sort of distributed cognition version of willpower i think yeah i think that's definitely been lost and stigmatized or it's like difficult to do that i think well at the moment because anytime i associate community and accountability with anything it just sounds like poison (laughs) it just sounds very well it's just like usually kind of i don't know icky and uncomfortable but i mean maybe that's just inherently what it is but well i i I think you're i think probably there's the word accountability is what sounds icky and uncomfortable because like the kind of accountability i'm talking about is weird Every time you're part of a community, every time you participate in a conversation, it's happening because yeah. I have expectations for what I think is okay to say in this conversation, and you do too. And I'm not going to say something that that steps too far outside of that. We're keeping each other accountable for for our sort of sanity or like our our manners. I mean, that's what manners are too. Manners are, are like manners are fundamentally social, and it's social accountability, mm-hmm. right? So I I, I think it's. Maybe we have to rescue the word accountability, but obviously it's icky to you and to me to some <laughs> extent for a reason. Why Why did it get icky for us? I don't know. I think it's, it's it feels very obligatory and unnatural. It's like, oh, well, I guess this is the point. Or like depending on the context, it's just like, oh, well, I guess I need to ask them about how they're doing versus like, an organic but like i think partially yeah, it is, un, is un, sort of organic yeah but. but like there is always like oh even if you're going to apply it to like our book club it's like oh did you do the readings like it's it's a sudden jolt in the conversation mm-hmm. it makes the other person uncomfortable yeah but yeah, it is it's it's uncomfortable <laughs> to have that and 
yeah, is there, there's not really a way around it. I mean, there, there, there's just different levels of accountability. And I think probably, probably maybe if you focus too much on it, it becomes this thing where it's just you have a list of the things you're accountable to. And it's not like, like with our book club, there's like there's one question. And then below that, there's more abstract questions that get asked without even really asking them. Like, did you engage with the content? Did you, did you, did you take notes? Did you have a good week? Did you actually, were you a good person this week? Those things are all, we're still keeping accountable, each other accountable on those levels too. We just don't have to as directly ask about them. And I think in like growing up or like hearing different pastors talk about how to like being accountable, it's like, or even like the way dad talked about it, it was just like, okay, here's your list of questions and you're going to ask like 13 uncomfortable questions and it just, it, I don't know why, but like I definitely relate to you on, on like thinking about that sort of accountability just feels really, it feels like almost creepy or it feels, it's very unnatural, obviously, but it, like, so it's, you need to have some level of unnatural accountability, but if you do too much of it, then it, it kind of ruins your relationship with accountability, I think. Well, like you said, a lot of it can potentially happen without even necessarily talking with the person. Yeah, if you're like, how is your week? You don't mm-hmm. even have to it's say just that always. S- more subtle ways, but some things you can't you can't know that way, I guess. Mm-hmm. And those are like the unfortunate black or white questions, I guess. Yeah, yeah, but and, and so if so, as far as actually solving this problem of of trying to figure out how to engage with social media and and engage with the well, not just but just media in general. Maybe that's the best way to just how to engage with media, if I can let that be an encompassing term. Trying to figure out how to do that, uh, we maybe can make progress on a community level too. Like personally, and, and, and that's partially what we've, we've been doing by trying to have conversations about this a little bit. Like it's come up a couple of times and to the extent that we, like we've talked about it together, that's helped me to like, I, I even sometimes like kind of am paying attention to how, how is Evan using his phone? And that that encourages me to, to change my experience or change my um, expectations for what I should be doing, because I feel like a certain I don't know. It's like, when I see you acting a certain way, it's like oh I, I'm that's like you're on my level or like you're you're my peer, and so we should act more or less. If if you're gonna make it an effort there, then I should too because we're in this together. Yeah think uh it's it's tricky i guess because it's also a pass to kind of let yourself slide when it's like oh i mean offloading it like you want to be in partnership with like like looking at my peers as both an example they're also going to be something i can use to justify what i do too and like you specifically point out the things or like try to notice the things that they do Right. that I want to justify myself. So it's... And I th- I think that can be positive too. I mean, I, I definitely, like I, I've, I've felt like I've seen, I had felt, felt personally convicted to live my life in a certain way, set certain boundaries for my behavior. And then even within our book club, saw Connor or saw you or saw Andrew approaching things a little bit differently. And that gave me, in some cases, that gave me freedom to... to expand a little bit of what I thought was okay and, and give myself a little bit of forgiveness for it. But in, in, sometimes it was like you were approaching something and it was just actually worse than, than the expectations that I was giving on myself. And then I just kind of backpedaled a little bit. But I think that's just, it's sort of unfortunate, but it's an, it's an inevitable feature of participating in, in a community is that part of your abstract sense of like of morality or of like what's, a, what's okay behavior gets, you know, like your community your distributed cognition level of thinking about it happens too. Like you, you have both your individual and your community in there. Like I, ideally you want to have, you don't want to have one totally dwarf the other one. You want to make sure that they're in a, in a mutual relationship. Yeah. I think that's a, uh, a nice way of uh, putting a sales pitch towards getting some get, friends around. Have a book yeah. club. Get on. Yeah. <laughs> People you can look up to or people yeah. that you can try to emulate. I was interested that at the end he did start talking about that. Like I don't I don't know what a, a non theistic or what a, a a naturalist community looks like. I feel like it it has to still be I mean we, we kind of both agreed there that it still ends up being a religion, but it's just I don't know. I'll have to keep thinking about that because it's it's 
difficult to think about trying to just create a religion from the ground up, even if, <laughs> like, if you try to do that, I, I guess we sort of always do that, even if we're, we're name-wise identified with a movement, we still kind of get our own take on it based on our community. But the only, I think the only way to have a, well, to take advantage of all the resources that you have available to you is to engage with the ancient traditions too. Like if you want to go start a, a spiritual community or just a community, it's not going to last very long. It's not going to be very meaningful unless it's, unless it's tapping into, I mean, maybe you'll just kind of by random chance stumble upon the most important principles for being a community. But the fact that there are, there are, you know, long lasting traditions of like religious traditions that are full of, well, I mean, the fact that they've lasted, that, that should be a clue as to the fact that there, there's some wisdom in there. Anyway, I'm I'm still thinking about that. <laughs> You're right. We we can I can I can see we're done. So <laughs> I think that's good. Good spot to close. Yeah. Thanks for. I mean, it wasn't actually a good spot to close because. Well, it, it's, well, maybe it's, it is. It's ramping off into another set of thoughts, but I, it, it I'm means not ready to process them yet. It means that you don't just close. Yeah.